All righty. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is Hajim Zero Zero here, back with another quick movie re review. And just a heads up, this may be not really the last, but um, it's gonna be a while before I shoot an another video. I don't know how long. Um, I'll be moving out of this my current place of residence. Um, and just some personal stuff I semi gotta go through. Even though as currently as today, it had some really, really good news, but I'm not going to go that deep into it. But besides all that, um, that was really for my listeners in case they were curious and wondering. But um, this uh, review is The Animatrix, and um, just right now, I'm not going to go into massive detail with, with each story. Because uh, if you look up the Nostalgia Critic and a few other... Um, YouTubers, I know there's a bunch of them that actually talk about it, go into detail of each one. Um, majority of it, I'm just going to talk about the concept and the people who were behind it because it's very interesting of, of who they were. So, um, the Animatrix, uh, like the, the whole Matrix franchise, it's one of the, the one good credit I can give to them despite of the bad criticism. It's like one of the first franchises to tell its story narratively through multi multiple mediums. So, uh, it was funny because I think when this came out, like right after the first movie, this and the video game at the time, Into the Matrix, was, was had made them a lot of money. You know, both of them combined versus Reloaded and Revolutions. And of course, they have done some comic books, which, you know, you, you really have to read the comics to get more of the concept ideas because it was a lot of stories they put in there. It's pretty much its own Twilight Zone if you want to call it like how it, it has different stories within a similar, well, not narrative, but all around the matrix. So with this one, it's nine different stories and it, and it really hits on the concepts from the first film, as well as having five stories, you know, connect with the movie. Um, the first and second Renaissance was pretty much the origin story of how, you know, the fall of man, you know, how machines had dominated everything and, and how, you know, the Matrix was actually created, um, especially going back to what Morpheus said, you know, we gave birth to AI, which spawned um, a huge giant race of machines. And uh, the final fight of, of Osiris is pretty much the semi glue that pretty much elevates the rest of the series at that point. It, it shows the origin of how Zion, yeah, was shown. I mean, uh, not Zion. The, the the machine army over Zion was shown. And if you play the video game, they give a little bit more information that you don't see in the movie. Pretty much, Into the Matrix to me was a giant, you know, deleted scene. Um, it showed a lot of interconnected plots, of course. You know, pretty much what the Logos crew was doing while you know Neo and and the others were on their separate missions. Um. And uh, detective story, I think, interconnects. Um, you know, some people say it does. It's really up in the open, I think, on the fans. Um, because it doesn't really say if it takes place, you know, after the, the, the first movie or before, you know, before they contacted Neo. And, of course, Kid Story um, was another one that's connected uh, to the movie. It's, uh, it deals with a blue pill who freed himself from the matrix uh, without, you know, having a per proper guy. Pretty much he knew that the that world didn't exist. So technically when he had killed himself, he was supposed to die like for real, for real. But, you know, they had another story on here that was just as it was the same thing, except the difference was that, you know, he was, you know, pulled back in the system. But, um... All these stories, uh, the more and more I watch it, they have some very, very unique ideas that were explored in the first movie. And, you know, as I said, um, the Beyond story talks about, you know, glitches that happen in the system. And if you saw the first movie with the deja vu, you only saw it that way. You know, other glitches that happen in the system where physics don't exist and, you know, um, anomalies or, or stuff happens on the side. The one interesting thing I didn't I didn't catch was an animal eating its own shadow and, and the shadow became a part of it. So um, that one was visually unique. Um, Matriculated uh, was a story that dealt with, um, you know, since the machines created the matrix of their generation, what if we can take a machine and put, you know, it into our own um, 
simulated dream world. Pretty much every night you go to sleep and you have a dream, you're generating a dream world, you know, of your own making. So they were really converting. The, well, they gave, ironically, the machine the choice to convert, which goes back into the reloaded, you know, and revolutions, you know, the, the, the anomaly of choice of being freed even once they were aware of what the matrix was. So, um, what was the other story I, I had in mind? Uh, program was another interesting one. That one was tra tra a traditional anime, you know, um, story. It was done by the guy that did Ninja Scroll. So, um, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. You know, they got a lot of classic anime d directors or animators from those classic films in, our, in the, in the nineties and, you know, to do, you know, that movie, I mean, to do these stories and with program, it was pretty much um, the story of, of Cypher. It was a character being uh, thrown at a test of do they really want to go back uh, to the Matrix and are they willing to kill someone who is putting them in a position to to make them, you know, go back into the system, you know, or or double cross uh, the, the, the machines. I'm trying to think of the next story I didn't talk about yet. I already talked about the, the detective story, Howard Boy Detective. You know, that one was the most interesting one. The guy that did Cowboy Bebop had did that one. Um, uh, Shish Shishiro uh, Watanabe, pardon me if I miss, um, pronounce his name. And um, the same guy that, that did Program, he did World Record. Uh, it was all of them more visual different styles. You know, of course, I, I learned that animators and directors semi two different things, you know, um, but I, I bet that the directors can draw, of course, but... Uh, world record was pretty much like the kid story one, except this character was a track star. And what the, uh, what the narrator has said is that people who are visually aware of the matrix, they must, um, display a uh, sensitivity in a questioning nature. And, you know, that character did. And it's funny because a lot of athletes kind of do do that, you know, um, give Mike Tyson, for example, recently, you see how calm he was and because mainly he's getting more high and, and of course you being high it elevates your consciousness, consciousness to a certain way. And at the same time, some people say that he was hard anyway, because he is so sensitive. He does care about people, you know, um, even when he talked about Tupac and Tupac talked about him, how he said, you know, that's, that's really like his big brother. You, you know, um, they came from the same, you know, cloth, <laughs> you know, it's just that, Every day you're constantly trying to prove yourself yet yeah, to, to people to not really fuck with you or take you seriously. And and to me, that's really a sad thing, you know, that people are like that. But it's a dog eat dog world. Um, I don't know if I talked about all of the nine stories. Um, uh, the behind the scenes uh, aspect, um, the guy that did uh, Beyond, um, the director, I found out he was one of the animators for Akira. And um, I think behind the scenes, they said he took the longest to do his story. Uh, he really is a hardcore, dedicated samurai. Like, you know, if it's one small detail, he'll go back from scratch and start over again. And when I heard that, that reminded me of, of, of the, the Capcom team, you know, back in the day before everything got fucked up with them. But, you know, with Resident Evil, you know, that went through so many de de developments. And if it was one something that wasn't working, they'll start, you know, from scratch. And same thing with Resident Evil 2 and in the early Street Fighter games. Um, the other uh, interesting um, animator uh, for, if you've seen, oh, well, he's from the one that did the second Renaissance. Um, I don't know his name, but you've definitely seen his work. The people who's, who have lived through the early 2000s when Toonami had those movies and they had one called blue submarine number six that animator the one who did all that he did second renaissance and you can kind of see it on here i think even it crossed over with um the beyond story how they had these 2d you know characters and then you had these three dimensions at the same time and for the final flight of osiris they had the final fantasy team from the one that did the final fantasy spirits within but i bet a few of the um the original creator i think um, uh, Sakaguchi san, you know, had had a little bit of his, you know, toe in that one as well. Um, of course, uh, the guy that did Cowboy, Cowboy Bebop, he did um, Kid Story and World Record. 
And if you guys ever saw Kill Bill, that animated um, snippet of Oren's um, past, I think that animator had did Kid Story. If you look at them both, how it has, you know, the whole pencil work design and it really looks amazing. It, it's one of my favorite stories. Uh, that one in, in Detective Story, of course. Um, the last one matriculated was done by Peter Chung, the guy that did um, Eon Flux and Rugrats. And he did uh, some of the Riddick animation uh, movies. I don't know what he's doing now. But hopefully I didn't miss anyone. Again, if I did, you can, you know, get at me in the comments. Um, the good thing about this DVD in particular, it talks about the brief history of, of anime. And I remember in college that we had, um, you know, a project to do animation from all over the world. And it was funny because Japan was off limits. You know, eventually my teacher broke that mold because, you know, it really wasn't that many countries to go around. I know Canada has its own animation, you know, United Kingdom. I think we had Australia and it sucks because if I was, you know, with the, the, the Japanese animation, you know, um, uh, team, we could, I could have showed them the documentary that was on this at that time. But, you know, the good thing, they, they had the similar facts. They talked about, you know, the history of anime, you know, uh, it's a lot older than a lot of people think, you know, a lot of people would say Astro Boy was like the first when it really wasn't. They had other films. It's just that I don't think it was it was um, mainstream distributed. And of course, and it come to America and some of the original stuff is destroyed. There's only a few collectors who have that stuff. And it's really, really, really rare. And something is telling me some of the old anime or even some of the anime today, I wouldn't be shocked if they had, you know, if it came from original concept that the person now has rights to, and that's worth a lot of money. So I give you a good example, like how they had the original um, Batman uh, animatic for uh, the opening sequence. I heard that that, uh, excuse me, goes for a lot of money. And they even said the audio, uh, the audio, the original audio, I think would be a lot more you know, but that's been destroyed too, if anyone had it, but the original animation, I know Bruce Tim said it, 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 you know, it's very, it's very, very rare. Sometimes we come across people at conventions that, that have it and, and we're shocked because it, you know, most of that stuff was destroyed, you know? Um, but you know, uh, anime has a very good, uh, big history. I think I briefly talked about it in my old videos when I did my whole anime and animation, you know, uh, movie reviews but um to the people that you know do watch it the real reason why it appeals to a worldwide audience is because you know it's violent sexy and cool and even with their society you know uh them them being bombed you know the whole historical context uh had reshaped their whole you know society so uh you know it's probably one of the main reasons why you know the 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 visionary directors who collaborated with the Wachowskis on doing this, they understood, you know, it was it was really, you know, picking at their brain and they all had the same material. They all approach it differently. And as a matter of fact, Andy and Larry, they wrote for the stories on here themselves um, and collaborated with the other uh, uh, directors. And, you know, uh, it's probably one of the reasons why they love, you know, our zombie stuff, you know, the fall of society, you know, especially with the old R Romero films, you know, um, the, the director that did Samurai Shampoo, he even did an episode, you know, based around that in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, because, you know, it's kind of funny how when anime had came out in America, a lot of people, they frowned on it. They, you know, well, the geeks didn't, but the ones who grew up with traditional animation and they saw how graphic it was and it would be tripping out. Well, I was like, well, number one, you know, uh, the history of animation anyway, it was pr pretty graphic. You know, they had certain porn movies and, and stuff that were animated before Winsler McKay had created Gertie the, the, the Dinosaur and Coco the Clown and all those characters in the early 1920s. So... And, you know, it's just that when Walt Disney showed up, he got smart and wanted to distribute it to kids because it was more kids in the in the household, you know, or in America than anything. But, you know, when you live in a society that, 
you know, had something very bad that happened to him, just like how 9-11 did. And now we we have more creative intellectual properties that are greenlit, you know, that really isn't controversial anymore. Like the whole Comics Code Authority by um, the Wortham doctor is not really taboo anymore because, you know, we talked about this and, and you know, stuff that that's being banned. And nine times out of 10, if you want to ban that, then you might as well ban the six o'clock news because, you know, it's shit like that that we see every other day, you know. Um, but that's a whole other topic, you know, how touchy stuff may get, you know. Personally, I don't really hear, especially here in America, I don't believe in banning anybody, you know, depending how, you know, if it, it really involves like uh, kids and, and, and sex, you know, depending on how that is, then, then I would, especially if they're being preyed on by an adult. But this is a free a country of free speech. And, you know, if it's even racist or or vile, you know, that person still has, you know, that platform to say what they want to say without being persecuted. Because when someone says something real, they want to be persecuted. Then then you have a, a whole communist, you know, a real communist situation. But besides all that, uh, you know, um, of course, this as well had influenced me on, you know, just doing a whole multimedia of, of animation in general. And, um, like I said, if you want to get, if you really like this, you definitely have to read the matrix comics because they explore a lot of, uh, some of the same ideas, but they flip it and look at it from a different perspective. And, um, even one of the artists that drew all the, the concept stuff, he even did, work in the comic book and in the second renaissance story in particular it went deeper into a um into the, you know the reason why that machine had killed its master which actually is a racist or racial connotation of what had happened between a slave and their, and their master you got to look that one up which is very very interesting when i looked at it off the top of my head i really can't re you know remember the whole thing but it was based off of a real historical context and, um, you know, it was, I was like, damn, you know, I didn't really catch on it. Then I thought about it when I saw it is, is actually said in the comic book story, you know, if you read it, cause I think they, they mention it. I don't think they go on, on, you know, certain deep details, but the racial connotation was there. But, um, that's pretty much all I have to say. Uh, you know, only thing I can think of is of course, uh, Carrie Ann Moss and Keanu Reeves, they came back to reprise their voices at Neo and Trinity in this, but they're not really heavy in the story. They created a lot of new, you know, characters for each story. Um, and the guy that played uh, uh, the kid in this, he's in the he's in the sequels as well. He's in Reloaded and Revolutions. He's in the comics and the Matrix Online. And um, the only bad thing I, I can really say about this series is that I wish they made you know, more, more of this, this, this to me was a tease, you know, you know, in my opinion, they should have each one of these stories, they could have did a, a individual, you know, episodic thing on like 15 episodes. And I would have, anybody would have watched that, you know, um, you know, I'm not really too sure about the second Renaissance, unless you want to look at the, the Terminator Salvation, um, movie, which I pretty much said before, the Matrix and the Terminator was supposed to be one film. And when you see the second Renaissance and then you look at Terminator Salvation, how that story was told, you, that can definitely be be rolled over into that. You, they they could have done a, a very good story on that. So that's just, just my opinion. Um, besides all that, that's all I have to pretty much say. Uh, again, that comment box is open. So like, comment, share, and subscribe. And um, I will talk to you guys later. Sayonara.